Welcome to, what is today? Thursday. Welcome to Thursday. And today we're doing something a little bit different. So first of all, uh, there is a poll in the general discord on the channel. So thank you for those of you who filled that out about our experiment on Tuesday. What I would like to do today is again, something a little bit different. Ooh, now, now go live is working. So I can now click the go live and hopefully it will be going live. So today we're lucky to have Dr. Mike here. And uh, Mike is recent PhD graduate from CS. He is a human computer interaction researcher at Waterloo. And he uh, recorded a talk for us. So we're gonna do something a little bit different today. So he's done, he's done um, work on AI systems and crowdsourcing and medical stuff, which he goes into his talk. But what, what I'd like to do today is actually have people watch his talk together. Um, so I'm gonna put you into small breakout rooms and then you can watch the YouTube talk that is in uh, the, the Slack channel, um, on Mike's, Mike, Mike's new Slack channel for today. And you can go into these breakout rooms and then talk to each other while you're watching it. So ask each other questions, comments, uh, whatever you'd like to do, but then there'll be a few minutes after the talk for you guys to talk amongst yourselves and come up with what you think is particularly interesting or what questions you have. So then that way, we, when we all come back together, then we can go and talk with, talk with Mike about this cool stuff that he's done. Uh, but I wanted to give you a chance to watch, watch the video together. So I wanted to see if that would work better or worse than asking you to watch the video before class. So this is another experiment. Let's see how this goes. So this time I'm going to create a breakout room, try to create a breakout room. Um, questions about this before I, I throw people into breakout rooms. I have a question. Should I, join, should I join any Slack or Discord channel or something, or is that not required for now? It's not, um, so you are absolutely welcome to, uh, and I will give you the link to that in a second, um, but you are not required to, because I can keep track of questions and bring them up if people uh, would prefer to just ask in text instead okay. of. Yeah, sounds good. I just, just wanted to make sure I'm, I'm, I haven't used Discord in a while, but I have it installed, so I'm happy to try. But it's good okay. if it's not required. That's that's fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Other questions. I had a question about uh, the YouTube video. So, once we're in the breakout room, should one of us play it and then just share our screen so we're all watching it at the same time? And if so, are we able to do that? Um, so there there is technology, so you could uh, share your screen and watch it exactly the same time. I was just assuming people would hit play at roughly the same time. That going for the low low tech solution. All right, welcome back everyone. I feel like this semester is just me figuring out how to use Zoom, even though I've used it for years. So you can't extend breakout room times, good to know. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you later whether you thought watching a video in a small group was worthwhile at all. Um, but why don't we start um, by asking some questions. Either, either dropping it into the Discord channel, which Mike can see, or just uh, unmuting yourself and, ask, and asking uh, anything you had questions about or anything you thought that was particularly cool. I've got a, a question. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you ever had a look at finding out which of the, uh, uh, the ambiguity explanations were right. So like a lot of a lot of these these issues, like even diabetic retinopathy, like with long term follow up, you could find out what, what is the right answer. And then you could go back and find out which explanations were the correct ones. Yeah, uh, really good question. Sort of, I, I think that points at sort of the possibility of um, a longitudinal observation, figuring out objective outcomes and trying to correlate. Um, human interpretation to those objective outcomes, like did the person turn blind after five years or not, right? Um, short answer, we did not, simply because we didn't have the longitudinal data sets available. Um, I think that's a really good idea. That's something that I would love to do. It's just, it just wasn't really feasible with, with the resources we had available. Um, 
for the sleep stage classification thing, I think there wouldn't really be a thing that you could do because um, I think even if you figured out, okay, this person does have uh, this sort of sleep disorder or maybe even something related like, like a neurodegenerative disease, I think you wouldn't be able to sort of disentangle the relationship between individual sleep stages at a 30 second level to that sort of abstract macroscopic outcome. Um, for, and, and the question I think also remains for, even for the more concrete case of say um, blindness, it, it's still like, even if the person turned blind, it's, I, I don't think it's um, trivial to say sort of five years before that, we would have had a certain level of diabetic retinopathy. I think, I'm not sure if it's, if that became clear in the talk, um, the diagnosis that these doctors made was actually um, ultimately on a five point scale, sort of from uh, no diabetic retinopathy to the most severe form and then uh, three steps in between. Um, so I guess you could sort of binarize it to referable disease, non-referable disease and so on. But um, there, there would still remain some questions around, can we actually map that back to what would have been the correct answer? But I think it's, it's a great idea uh, to, to try to correlate that with objective outcomes. It's actually, a, I think, a bigger question in the space, sort of like, will the machine learning community as a whole move away from human labeled data and try to only focus, or not only, but like primarily focus on data that you can just like, um, record in the wild using sensor technology and the like, um, which might be used as proxies for human interpretation. So that that's actually related to a question I had, which was, it, if I understood right, it seemed like you were saying there is a ground truth, we just may not be able to know it. But, but could there be cases where there actually is not a ground truth? Um, because that, it seems like that yeah. could be different from, a, that's kind of a different kind of problem. Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, I think, again, short answer, yes, definitely. Uh, there, are, there are many of these kinds of tasks. For example, whenever it is a question of taste or preference, I guess the goal is not to find the one single correct answer, but to say, find the right, a representative diversity of answers. Um, something like, uh, you know, when Google asks people to um, score one of their, you know, search results or something like the ranking ranking order of uh, search results, that's mostly, I think, like a preferential question. Um, or when it comes to, you know, music recommendations from Spotify, these kinds of things, I don't think we would ever be able to find the one single correct answer, not even maybe on the individual level because preferences can change over time and so on. Um, that's definitely one, like the broader domain of preferences is something where you wouldn't really be able to apply this technique. So it's some, like in some way, my work was situated in this weird space where you kind of expect that you would have one answer in the end that is ideally the most correct one. But given the way that this answer is produced through human interpretation and there's potentially no other objective reference standard, you're kind of forced to find some way to aggregate um, uh, multiple opinions into what you believe to be a better one. <laughs> well, and that and that's a good point. Also, uh, if I understood, one of the things you were hinting at is there, there's the question of what what is truth and what is the ground truth. But then there's a more practical question: is what are you using it for? And yeah. in that case, it may not really matter. Exactly. Yeah. And that is like, for example, the uh, clinical outcomes idea, um, sort of mapping building systems based on predicting actual clinical outcomes that hints exactly at what you just uh, suggested, I think, because really what we want is not to find the right level of diabetic retinopathy based on um, some medical guideline. Really what we want to do is uh, avoid blindness. So if, if, yeah, I think if you can uh, avoid that intermediate step in the future, that's, that would be a good idea. Um, it's just simply that I think the social structures of the way we uh, sort of regulate these kinds of systems and that the way that specifically in the medical domain that diagnoses are, are constructed or made um, just doesn't really, I think, allow for these kinds of future, future, futuristic almost <laughs> systems yet. Um, but I think, I think in the long run, we, I, think, I think society will probably um, acknowledge that that's a good idea and then probably move into that direction, hopefully. <laughs>
We've got three questions in the chat. Are you able in the Discord? Are you able to easily see those, or would you like me to read some off? Um, no, I can see them actually. I'm just it's the first one. So the cost of the data collection is high, correct? That's the oh wait, are there more? That's the first one I see. Yep, here. that was the first of three. Yeah, I imagine it would be quite difficult to collect enough ambiguity discussions to be able to drive or improve an AI classifier. Any thoughts on data quantity amplifications? Yeah, sort of. If I do I understand the question uh, right, in the sense that you might be able to use sort of data augmentation techniques for this, or am I misunderstanding? The, yeah, the I, I guess that's kind of what I was thinking. I, I imagine I having a bunch of experts, medical professionals in a room is quite expensive. So in yeah. order to get this data, I mean, right. I'm, I'm aware of how much data it takes to train an AI classifier. And if you think about how you're going to do that, you need some kind of artificial method to improve the data or expand yeah. it so that it can generalize. Yeah, really good point, definitely. I tried to highlight the a little bit on the last slide with the cost cost benefit trade off. Um, to be honest, that's something I haven't really done a lot of work on yet because we were more interested in sort of the, the general idea of how would something generally work that that is in that space. Um, I think like, like one idea that I have in that context is that the most I, I mean, I believe the most the most important um, task for for these kinds of ambiguous spaces is to figure out the validation or evaluation data set. And you might not, you might not have um, the same level of quality of ambiguity explanations in the training data set, um, assuming that you treat it as sort of a supervised learning task. Um, but as long as you, you, you have like high trust in, in your validation and evaluation sets, um, I, think, I think that's the right focus to have, but that still might be very expensive and also potentially prohibitive to do, um, depending on how many resources you have and access to the right human experts. Um, so good question. I, I can't think of a straightforward way just intuitively right now of how I would try to augment these data sets. But if someone here has an idea, I'd be curious. Or that sounds like a t to be determined. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I think the next, sorry, I remembered I should uh, re re read some of the questions out loud since we're recording and people who are watching a video can't see, may not see to the Discord. So then there's a question about adding noise to the EEG study. Um, was that the part where people were given kind of false justifications or is that a different type of noise? Yeah. So um, I'm also just rereading the question. So I think the question also has one component about, do you tell the participants that the descriptions are by experts? So that one is easy to answer. Um, we made participants believe that none of it was coming from a human, that everything was generated by a model, um, including those, those ambiguity explanations that we showed to them in, in natural language text. Although we did say that, hey, these are specific instructions from this medical guideline, from this list of 36 instructions. So we didn't pretend like it was um, sort of like natural language generation. It was more like pick one or two out of 36. Um, and regarding sort of the accuracy of those, of those explanations that we switched for a random um, other explanation, what we did there was um, basically, for every for every instance of of explanation that we decided to perturb, we selected one of the other explanations that were actually relevant to that particular predicted class. So it was not completely random. It was not like if the if the system predicted wake for the, with that explanation that we replaced the explanation with um, something for REM sleep, for example. So it kind of made sense. But it simply was an explanation that was never mentioned in the actual expert discussion before. Uh, so, so, so the goal really was to perturb the explanation so it wasn't obvious that it was completely wrong and completely off on the class, 
but still make sure that it might not be as pertinent to the specific ambiguity of that specific instance of uh, biosignal data to be classified than the original expert discussion would have been. So yeah, I guess I asked this question because um, it seems like if it was just like some completely random explanation, like your your uh, the person actually uh, the participant might you know lose trust in the model itself instead of testing you know like um, whether or not it's helpful or not the, the explanation right. or whatever. So yeah, yeah. That, that's think, super helpful though. Thank you. That's a that's a really good point. I think I totally skipped over that in the presentation. So I'm glad you asked the question. Um, and yeah, I'm, I was honestly surprised to see big, big differences in terms of how people classified, um, these ambiguous cases, depending on whether the explanation for ambiguity was high quality or slightly perturbed. Um, because to me as a non-domain expert, these differences seem, seemed, uh, subtle in a sense, but obviously that was, that was clear enough of, of sort of like a perturbation for all the experts to. For, for, for at least for the system to affect their decision making. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yeah. So I'm I'm really interested in the um, in in deception in in human subject studies. So you could you could give them the the real justifications. You could could give them perturbed ones or random ones, or you could even give adversarial ones where mm -hmm. you are are trying to get them to give the wrong label. Right. So I guess, so you've got this, this all kind of range of, of things you could test. Why, why did you choose the kind of perturbations and what, what does that tell you? What do results from that study tell you as opposed to, uh, for instance, this adversarial case? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I think our rationale was to since we didn't, didn't have the predictive system in place at the time when we wanted to run the study, um, our goal kind of was to, sim or to, to have this Wizard of Oz approach with where we faked a system that shouldn't be too perfect, but the imperfections that it had shouldn't be also not too random, uh, like, like we talked about before. If they had been too random, they would, pr would probably have um, Sort of eroded trust in the end user immediately when the when the when they realized okay this system is predicting explanations for a completely wrong class, um, so that was the goal and that was the reason why we did it the way we did it. I think I think we we totally absolutely did brainstorm this sort of hypothetical experiment of uh, having these kinds of group discussions going on and randomly injecting like uh, either. A model-based agent or just a Wizard of Oz agent into the discussion that also produces these kinds of arguments and tries to convince uh, people to to classify to something that's definitely wrong, or maybe to to sway them into one of the two directions for an ambiguous case or one of the three directions. Um, yeah, I guess that's an interesting question. What these results would tell us, I guess, <laughs> it, maybe in some way it would tell us more about the weaknesses of. Uh, Sort of human bias or human uh, the the ability to convince humans to do the the wrong thing, um, then it would yeah. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a worst case scenario, right? right? Where you've got you've got the the jury is making decisions and there's one guy who's biased and really wants to convince them, um, right? But then if you could if you could show that there's not a big effect or or even just understanding whether that one person could have a large effect or not on this kind of ambiguity system that that yeah. could be interesting and then if there was a large effect how could you protect against that or would you even want to maybe this is actually desired behavior that one person can have an outsized effect if they are convincing i i don't know right i'm not sure right. if that's a feature or a bug yeah i guess i mean i, I mean it was kind of baked into the philo into the philosophy of of this whole research agenda that it should be possible for the minority to convince the majority if their arguments are more sound or if the outcome is better. Um, so I guess like if the if it's if there is this ability and there is no bias towards um, this leading to worse outcomes, I think that's desired because it's it's sort of it, it, it strengthens it strengthens the argumentative aspect of, of human collaboration, which at least in those domains that I've been studying would be worthwhile. Um, but yeah, I, th I think the 
it would definitely be fun to run these studies and see see how far you can go <laughs> as long as nobody gets harmed yeah because then eventually you'll get back to what david was talking about with the trust and if yeah. if you realize there's a bad actor then you don't trust that actor but then you may just not trust the system exactly looking at more questions in discord right now was a bit fuzzy on how the ambiguity ai worked in the sleep study did it find cases that it found ambiguous or was it trained to find cases that humans would find ambiguous ah okay yeah that's uh, also a, an important clarification um so short answer again it highlighted cases that in the past discussions human had, humans had found um, ambiguous in the sense that multiple humans had disagreed on it. Um, that's what the sort of like the orange yellowish part in the interface at the top was highlighting. Um, although there was also um, this sort of this underlying model that we use that is a that we didn't develop but that exists just there out in the wild, which was relatively accurate and we use that as sort of like the, the baseline component of this AI to produce classifications and quantitative uncertainty. Um, so in a way it also highlighted visually and sort of numerically um, the machine uncertainty which is could be related but doesn't necessarily have to be perfectly correlated with the with what people would find ambiguous. There's actually some some research that that other people did um, in in Google Health actually that tried to sort of like um, basically try to predict which cases of this diabetic retinopathy data set people would disagree on, and they compared two uh, techniques for it. One technique was basically training a classifier to um, like a having a regular supervised machine learning approach where you train a classifier to predict the correct diagnosis and then using the sort of entropy over the classification uncertainties as a form of a level of, okay, if the entropy is high, then there will probably be disagreement among people as well. So using, using that as a proxy for disagreement prediction versus building a model that directly is trained to predict the outcome of disagreement. Uh, and I mean, the, the, the finding was, that okay, we can we definitely do significantly better at predicting disagreement if we train on that outcome directly, um, but the difference was not extremely large. So I think machine uncertainty can be used, at least to a certain extent, as a proxy for expert disagreement slash ambiguity, uh, at least in some tasks. Um, but now I'm I've been gone on a rant and I'm not sure if I actually answered the question. So <laughs> let's see um oh, that's that's great that answers my question okay <laughs> sounds good but then as as this system improves over time is it the goal for the ai to make better decisions is it the goal for the ai to make better to reach better outcomes with the humans in the loop or are those uh, so intimately intimately related it's not worth trying to disambiguate right um I guess, I guess the the at least from my perspective, the the ultimate goal is to improve decisions of the collaborative systems system of AI with humans in the loop or humans with AI in the loop. Um, I mean, a sub goal that could contribute to that would definitely be making the AI system more accurate. But the question would be, um, given that we have expert disagreement and we just like accept the fact we accept a world where we have to handle expert disagreement and ground truth um, there might be sort of like an upper bound of how accurate the system can become because we simply don't have this this absolutely objective reference standard so i guess we could break it down into in general we can try to make the system make good predictions but we can also try to make it better at this meta meta goal of saying we also want the system to be to calibrate quite well to how people would perceive ambiguous cases because because we know that machine uncertainty doesn't necessarily 
equal also sort of this human perception of ambiguity. Um, but it would be nice to calibrate those two um, in those two in a way that they are aligned so that the human has sort of feels um, better supported in, in that goal of, of grappling these ambiguous cases. At least that, that's how I see it. With the ultimate understanding that it would probably mainly foster trust. I'm not sure if it would uh, if it would be possible to ultimately say, hey, this also leads to better decisions. So th that is a bit of a, there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, there between the this ultimate goal of making making achieving better outcomes um, and fostering trust. But it can still be helpful, I think. Yeah, well, and that actually relates back. Uh, uh, serendipitously to uh, Tuesday's class, where we were looking at some case studies where we uh, uh, machine learning systems were bootstrapped using human data. And then over time, those systems became more capable, but it was still there are still humans in the loop. And this are we trying to come up with a completely autonomous AI versus are we coming up with the best human AI system we can have? And in something like healthcare or the military, it's probably you want the best human in the loop system you can have. But there, there I, I uh, would guess there are cases where having that full autonomous system where you, know, you use people on the earth to help the system train, and then when it's deployed to Mars, it just acts autonomously. I bet there are situations where, where either one of these could be the end goal. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's a that's a good point. I think like the I guess like the Mars example that you point out is interesting because there it might simply be prohibitive to have a human in the loop, either because of sort of the the delay you have in communication or because you simply might not be able to control the system at all. Um, and the I think the sort of military and medical examples are good ones to illustrate that maybe you want to have a human in the loop not only to correct the AI system when it's wrong, but also to make sure that at least for a substantial amount of cases, you have this accountability of, uh, we know that we don't just let some system loose on society that could potentially harm people or, or change their lives forever um, without having this, this accountability in place. Uh, so, there was recently, I want to say it was a week ago, a little bit south of Edmonton, someone, a couple of guys in a Tesla was pulled up, were pulled over. Uh, I think the Tesla was going, it was going 110. The police came up behind it, so it accelerated to 120. And then they looked in the window and both of the guys had their seats back and sleeping. Um, so this is a great example of a human AI system that it failed in an interesting way. Um, that it, and, and at this point, that kind of technology does need that kind of accountability. And my, my understanding is that the guy who is in the driver's seat would be charged. It's not the Tesla engineer's fault. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a tricky one. I, I, I am not sure if I read all the details of that case. Uh, was anyone harmed in that uh, particular instance? Okay. Thankfully, no, it was um, two, I want to say 20 somethings from uh, BC. Okay. Um, so, it, so it was more, a, I can't believe they were doing this instead of something really bad happened. So if, if they had crashed or hurt someone, I wonder if things would be different. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really interesting um, edge case, actually, because you might say, okay, I mean, in a future world where these these autonomous vehicles are reliable enough, it's you can sleep in them. They are that's what they are designed for, right? So that you can spend your mental resources or recharge your mental resources uh, because you don't have to drive. Um, but I would totally agree that as of today, that should definitely be illegal, <laughs> and <laughs> I would I would hope that those folks uh, would be held accountable for it. Um, yeah, that's. That's tricky. So I think I think the next um, upvoted comment was in the talk you mentioned. When should we communicate ambiguity? And I think I'm not sure whether the question is when you should do that or how. It says how, but I'm not sure which. Vlad, would you would you like to jump in and, and see if I'm understanding your question correctly? 
Yeah, so it was in the follow up work, like right at the end of the presentation, you mentioned, uh, I think it was like a last point, you're like, um, it might be expensive, or there's a cost, or maybe sometimes you don't want to communicate it, um, which seems very reasonable. And so I was wondering if you had like, some ideas of how you would address these next steps on how do you decide when you should actually communicate ambiguity versus like, if we communicate ambiguity, it's good. If we don't, it's bad. But I'm sure there's like some cases it's better than not. Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good and a tricky one. Uh, good and a tricky question. Um, the I think I think the way I think about it um, currently is if you display information about ambiguity, it could potentially always be associated with sort of an increased uh, cognitive workload for people to parse that information try to make uh, make sense of it, put it in a context and so on. So if there's any way that we can avoid surfacing that kind of information for, for cases where it doesn't really matter if it's like one or the other for the ultimate decision that we'll make upon that sub-decision, um, then we can probably just skip it and, and try to avoid um, confusing people. Uh, for, like one, one concrete example would be if we have this like diabetic eye disease, we have a five point scale, uh, of mild, moderate, uh, none at all, severe and proliferative. And only if it's at least severe, you want to treat the patient. Then probably if the ambiguity is between either no disease or only a mild form of disease, you might not want to bother um, a doctor to disambiguate that particular case, at least not in sort of like the deployed setting. Um, it might still be worth doing that in the when you collect the data for sort of like for the data set that you use for evaluation or training of the model. Um, but, but there might be, definitely might be room to not do that in, in the ultimate end user facing setting. And the, the other thing is, I think you, there might be potential to sort of cater to people's individual preferences. Actually in the, in the ambiguity aware AI study that was last in the presentation, we did uh, ask people to fill out this form um, from like a pre-existing survey instrument called, um, I think, um, intolerance of ambiguity scale, <laughs> um, which was kind of the only one I found out there, found there to that, that kind of had questions that you could also map to an automation use case. Um, and in short, like in a nutshell, our findings were that out of the relatively few participants we had, we had a pretty polarized um, set of preferences for I like ambiguous settings and I don't like ambiguous settings or people who are able to handle ambiguity in decision making are more like are more trustworthy than uh, than those are not than those that are not able to handle ambiguity in decision making these kinds of things so we had like almost like two halves like one was super pro ambiguity the other was con um, but unfortunately we weren't able to find any significant cor correlations of this preference to Sort of the ultimate preference of preferring the one AI assistant over the other, which I would have expected, but we didn't find it. Um, but I think it, I mean, there, there, there are many possible reasons why we didn't see it. It might have just been like uh, too small of a participant sample, or maybe we, maybe there were some nuances in it that, that we would have had to do differently to see it. But in general, I think there might be um, potential of catering to those kinds of preferences. Maybe it's just more cognitive load for some people to. Um, I have to try to comb through these all these nuances. Yeah, then maybe just a quick follow-up question. When you said that maybe um, it's not a sufficient amount of participants, so like, um, just I guess for you, how did you go about deciding how many participants was acceptable for all of these experiments, or just in general, like how do you go about making this decision? Yeah, good point. Um, so I think in our studies we mostly the number of participants was was dictated by either the budget or the availability of the experts so like for example in the crowdsourcing study we at some point we simply we, we just collect collected data until we ran out of money for that particular project um which is i think probably <laughs> probably not the best approach to do it but unfortunately quite common in human human, human computer interaction as far as i understand um better approach would be to um, sort of do power analysis and try to figure out what is the what is an appropriate minimal amount of participants so that I'm able to measure a minimal effect size 
give them a certain level of confidence and sort of like a certain power level. Um, I, yeah, to be like, to be frank about it, we did not do this for our studies, mainly because, for example, in the expert studies, we knew that we would pr probably, the power analysis would tell us, get at least 30, 40, 50 experts. And we knew that we only had these 12 available, for example. So the, so the decision was easy to just take those, all the ones we had. Um, but I think like the most reasonable approach probably would be if you don't have necessarily have these kinds of constraints to say, hey, especially for the effect size that you might expect to see, uh, um, it might be worthwhile running sort of like one, two or three pilot experiments that might tell you, give you a rough idea of what kinds of differences might you be able to observe uh, during the different or between the different conditions that you that you're putting into the experiment, um, and then using using that as sort of guidance to run your power analysis. But I think there are there are different opinions on how how best how how that is uh, or what the what the most appropriate thing to do is in that in that case. Awesome, thank you. I I don't think we have. Uh, so we've got five minutes left. I don't think we really have time to dig into this question very deeply, but I was wondering, Mike, if you had any question, uh, thoughts off the top of your head about how ambiguity, confidence, and uncertainty could be related. Because it, it seemed like we were you were saying earlier uh, how you know the confidence of the classifier could be used to help figure out when you'd want to bring in experts but mm -hmm. confidence could mean a, a few different things. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you had any off the cuff thoughts on this. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice question. I like it. It's like nice and philosophical. I mean, my, my approach to it is sort of uncertainty. It's at least the way it is defined here is sort of aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. For me, that always has to do something with sort of a lack of knowledge about either the current state of the world or the future state of the world, including all the different, all the details of how, um, you know, all the, all the, all the subtle factors that contribute to human decision and so on, or to, to actions in the world contribute to that. Um, and, and ambiguity is a little bit something different, I think. It has something to do with human interpretation. So I, I think, I think there are some papers that say, hey, Ambiguity should be categorized as one subform of uncertainty. And if it was so, then I would probably call it maybe interpretative uncertainty or something like that, um, or interpretation uncertainty. Um, I mean, of course, you could try to like in an, I guess like in a, in a universe where everybody believes in determinism, you could <laughs> probably try to remove or, or like map interpretation uncertainty to some form of epistemic uncertainty. It's like if I knew the state of the brain of that particular expert and I could predict all the future action, actions, then I could predict that ambiguity. Um, but but I think it's it's qualitatively something different. Um, the question of confidence, I'm not sure if I have the best sort of the best way to to put that into the right context there, because I feel like confidence might be the like a little bit less well defined. I think it has like so many different meanings. For example, you might have a level of confidence in an experiment, um, uh, which might be like type one error rate, or you might have sort of this subjective confidence that people have in their decisions that you might measure on like a Likert scale. Um, so, or you might have sort of like machine confidence or machine certainty where you produce say entropy over the posterior distribution of, of, of uh, class, class probabilities. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure, not sure how I would put confidence in there, but I, but I think because I think you hinted a little bit at sort of how can we make use of these in relation to each other, um, there might be ways to leverage, for example, machine uncertainty, which could be closest to epistemic uncertainty, maybe. Um, to decide, hey, when do we need more labels for this particular case? Because if we have high machine uncertainty, we have a higher probability that we might also see expert disagreement. Um, so that could be one of the factors to include for deciding how to allocate labeling resources 
towards ambiguous or non -so ambi not so ambiguous cases. Um, but there are probably many other ways we could we could leverage this. And I, I understand we're running out of time, so I'll probably stop here. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think this is a great place to break. So thank you again, Mike, so much for for teaching us about your dissertation. Um, this was also a nice example of what what kind of a dissertation size contribution looks like. So that was very cool. Um, so for students in the class, remember, we're going to be switching gears next week and hopping into reinforcement learning. So there's something you need to read for Tuesday. And if you haven't taken an RL class before, I suggest you watch the video. Um, but Mike, thank you again for joining us. And I'm gonna shut off the streaming and the recording now. So if you happen to have time to stick around for an informal after-class chat, we'd love to have you. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. And I, I should definitely be able to be around a little longer in case anyone has any questions. So no problem at all. Thanks so much, that was fun. Thank you.